Since you can never have enough cookies in your cookie jar, I recommend you try a few of my favorites that I've updated with more wholesome pantry ingredients. Pecan, oat, and dark chocolate chunk cookies, chewy molasses crinkles, buckwheat espresso cookies, all today on Martha Bakes. For you chocolate lovers out there, Nate Hodge is here to walk us through all the intricacies of chocolate making. His innovative approach to an ancient tradition will shed new light on chocolate. So uh, walk us through the life of chocolate. I've never quite understood the whole process. Sure. So the cocoa bean, which we have right here, is the seed of the cocoa fruit. Cocoa fruit grows in South America, Africa, Caribbean, within about 20 degrees north and south of the equator. These large cocoa fruits, right? Cocoa fruits, yeah. Wow, they're so heavy. How much does an average one weigh? Um, they're going to weigh like about a kilo, so about two pounds. Oh, wow, these are very beautiful. So inside the cocoa pod is this cocoa fruit right here. It's like sort of a white mucilage, very, very sweet. And, uh, and these are all slimy. the seeds? And those are the seeds oh. like within the fruit. So that sweet, sticky fruit is used to ferment the cocoa beans. Can I take a, take a seed? Definitely take a seed. Um, so the fruit's going to be really sweet, and inside there is going to be the seed. Can I eat that? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's going to be pretty bitter because it hasn't been fermented yet. Um, but the fruit itself is very sweet. Mm, this stuff is sweet. Yeah. So don't bite into this pit. You can. Um, so that could be a job, just eating all, <laughs> <laughs> eating all the fruit eating, off. eating all the nice white fruit off the oh, yeah. seeds. Children in, in uh, cacao-growing countries love eating the fruit, mm -hmm. for sure. And then you spit the seeds out, dry them, and make, the out. And, make, <laughs> and make chocolate Not out of quite. them. Oh. <laughs> so the seeds are fermented um, using that sweet, sticky fruit, naturally fermented, to break down the complex amino acids so that it's less bitter. So this is inside the fruit. Exactly. That's what it is. OK. And then inside of this, the cocoa bean or cocoa seed, are cocoa nibs. So can I break one of these open? Break it open, yeah. What do you break it just um, with a knife? I would just, you could use a knife or you could just try to press it between your fingers. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, I can do it with this. There. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, so it is full of little cocoa nibs. It is full of little cocoa nibs. Oh. Um, and those, so you discard the hard shell. You discard the hard shell, yeah, because it doesn't have any flavor to it. Oh, okay. And that's the edible part and the part okay. that we use to make chocolate. So these are the nibs. Those are the nibs. And the and nibs are roughly 50% cocoa butter and 50% cocoa powder. Uh -huh. So that's where the, that comes from, for I, sure. I actually like the nibs. The even nibs though, are very good. Even though they're very bitter, mm -hmm. there's no sugar, mm -hmm. but they are delicious. They're flavorful. So once you get it down to the nib, then what? Then we have to uh, grind it up to start to coax that fat out of there, that cocoa butter. Now, so do you we, do this professionally? I do this professionally. Oh, you yeah. make chocolate? I make chocolate from the beans. So I uh, fly all over the globe and search out very good cacao plants, not unlike grapes or apples. Yeah, if you were going to make wine, you'd be traveling everywhere to get the right grapes. Get for the your, right for your, stock. And right. Yeah. So and how do you ferment those? Good. So the fruit goes into giant boxes that are made out of wood. And those are aerated after a couple of days and moved into another box so that the fruit can start to drain off. And so that, th this kind of rots off. Yeah, it sort of, it sort of gets hot right. and starts to bubble. And that helps ferment the seeds and make them less bitter, more fruity, more acidic. You want acidity in a good cocoa bean and not bitterness and astringency. So what kind of chocolate do you make when you finally get to the nib? Uh, so when we finally get to the nibs, one of the things that uh, I really like to do is work with the fat that's in chocolate naturally. We like to infuse that fat with different flavor. So we have a bar that we actually age the cocoa nibs in bourbon casks for five weeks so that the fat in the nibs takes on the aroma oh, take, of the I'll, barrels. I like bourbon. Sure. Let me take a little nibble. This is very dark chocolate. Um, it has what that percent cacao? 82. Wow, that's high. That's high. It's very high. But the bourbon barrel helps to mellow out some of the flavors that are in the nibs so that it's a little bit milder of a flavor than a lot of dark chocolate. And then another one we do is we steam the nibs over Cabernet Sauvignon so that steam oh. gets absorbed by the fat of the cocoa nibs. And where do you get all the Cabernet Sauvignon? That must be very oh, from expensive. California. It is expensive, <laughs> but it makes very good chocolate. And that's a cocoa bean from Peru, so it's a little bit different than the Tanzania cocoa that's in the I like this chocolate. better. It's sweeter. It's got a little bit more yeah. sugar to it. It's not yeah. quite as dark. 
I mean, I'm a milk chocolate fan, so <laughs> so I'm way off of this. Um, yeah. But this is better for me than the first one. The wine imparts a little bit of extra sweetness to it. Right. Um, we do do something that's close to a milk chocolate that we do with coconut shreds. Oh, this one? Yeah, and that's 60%, and it's going to be a little bit softer, a little bit creamier. When we grind down the nibs to make it into cocoa liqueur, we add uh, coconut shreds and same sort of process, release oh. the fat from I the can, coconut shreds. I can actually taste the coconut in this. Yeah. Yeah. It's what a pretty bar that is, too, with a modern design on yeah. top. And then you have molds for all these chocolates. Oh, yeah, you, for sure. And those are new molds? Yep, new molds that we've designed we've ourselves. Designed. And what's this, maple and... Nut. That's maple and nibs. So there are a lot of people that like to keep their sugar intake low, and that's one that we do without any sugar, any cane sugar at all. It's sweetened with maple syrup. And the nibs. And the nibs on top for a little bit of extra crunch. Mm, that's actually very good. Yeah, I, that's one of my favorites. Oh, that's very good. Very interesting. And what else? Ghost pepper, which is spicy. Um, and we have, this is our most popular oh, one salt. is our sea salt. And that's um, some what sea percent? salt. What percent? That's seventy-one percent, and that has a combination ah. of uh, maple sugar and cane sugar. One of the things that uh, we found working with um, unroasted cocoa beans is that the maple sugar helps to warm, warmth in the flavors of the. So when did this beans. salt and chocolate thing come about? It's been it's rather recent, isn't it? I think so. I think it's maybe in the last decade or so with the popularity of salted caramel. People uh, yeah. trying to draw out more flavor in chocolate by adding salt to it. So um, tell us why you don't roast your beans as other chocolate makers do. Sure. And, and where did that idea come from? Traditionally, on large-scale chocolate production, you're buying beans from all over the world and trying to uh, essentially homogenize the flavor as much as possible in order to get a consistent product. One of the things we decided to do early on is to really embrace the different the flavors yeah. that are in cocoa beans from Tanzania versus the Dominican Republic versus Ecuador. And roasting homogenizes that flavor? Not or? necessarily, but it definitely alters the flavor. And one of the things we wanted to do was show that that fermented flavor, that acidity, can have a really interesting flavor to it. So um, what are your favorite ways to pair chocolate? Since chocolate's a fermented food, it pairs really well with other fermented foods. Wine, obviously, beers and ciders. Uh, we actually really like pairing chocolate with cheese because you get a lot of the same nuance that you get in a finely aged cheese that you do with a well-fermented cocoa bean or well-fermented chocolate bar. This is some complicated f food, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very complicated food, and that's one of the things that I like to encourage people to approach chocolate the same way they approach cheese or approach wine, where you can really taste it and have conversations with And how long have you been working in the world it. of chocolate? Um, eight years now. And you love it? I love it. It's a wonderful industry. I've met all kinds of amazing people all over the globe doing it. Well, good luck. Good luck Thank with you. everything you do. What an interesting lesson. Thank you. I think you're really going to like my pecan, oat, and dark chocolate chunk cookies. They're outrageously good. You'll be shocked to learn they're actually vegan. Finely ground pecans, and I have to grind my pecans two cups of them. Fresh pecans, please. <laughs> Grind them in the food processor. The pecans act as the flour, while the dark chocolate adds a pop of bold flavor, and it bumps up the antioxidant levels of the cookie. So uh, grind these up. And just grind them till they're finely ground. Don't over-process into a pecan paste. We don't want a paste. We want more like a flour. That looks very good. And we have one cup of rolled oats. Again, make sure your oats are fresh. And this will be your, the base of your dry ingredients and a half a teaspoon of cornstarch. Very sticky cornstarch. A half a teaspoon of coarse salt and three quarters of a teaspoon of baking powder. It's a half and a half of a half. And you can just stir this up together. So these are your dry ingredients. Once you get these blended, we need three ounces of a dark chocolate. So you could use bittersweet or semi-sweet. And I have found that the easiest way to make chunks is just with a serrated knife. We want like quarter inch chunks. You could substitute semi-sweet bits, too, if you have those. Now, the reason I put some cornstarch 
into the dry ingredients, it adds structure to baked goods. And this can be helpful when they lack the glue of gluten. The cornstarch acts like flour and it absorbs liquid. So now put your chocolate bits in there too. Stir this all together. Chunky and wonderful. Okay, so now add a quarter of a cup of maple syrup. This is our sugar and maple syrup acts as, as sweet as sugar. It is tasty and if you have organic maple syrup, all the better. Do not use artificial maple syrup. A quarter of a cup of the best olive oil you have and a half a teaspoon of the best vanilla. And so now just stir this up. It is a crumbly, lovely, chunky dough. You can barely call it a dough. We have no eggs, no dairy, purely vegan. Very nice. Now we're going to put the cookies on parchment lined baking sheet. Preheat your oven to 325 degrees. And I'm using a quarter of a cup scoop for this. And this should make about 10 cookies. Really, pr I'm pressing it to the side of the bowl and with my hand. You could keep a little bowl of water next to you too if you want to use wet fingers to press. It's a little sticky and it'll stick to you. Now you could also incorporate into this cookie a dried fruit. Pieces of dried apricot would be awfully good with the chocolate. Dried cranberries would be delicious. Now rinse your hand, get them a little bit moist, and just flatten the cookie a little bit. It does help to have a wet hand. This helps compress the ingredients together and will certainly make all the cookies uniform so that they will bake at the same time. They're gonna take about 20 minutes to bake. And while baking, you can turn the baking sheet halfway until they're done. Set your timer. So transfer the cookies to a rack as they come out of the oven. Let them cool completely. And then you can try to get them into the cookie jar. But if the kids are coming home from school or you happen to desire a cookie, you might Settle for one or two or three of these. These will not last long. Enjoy. Crisp, chewy molasses crinkles have always been a cookie jar favorite. And today I'm giving them an update by using quinoa flour. It has a pronounced sesame-like flavor that pairs very well with molasses and spices. In the bowl of your electric mixer, cream one stick of butter. This is unsalted butter at room temperature. So cream that. When you're making cookies, it's all the kind of room temperature ingredients. And so this recipe calls for one cup of light brown sugar. Brown sugar has to be packed in tight. Just put that in the butter. And we're also using half a cup of white sugar. It's funny that they call for two types of sugar, but it really does make a chewy and crunchy cookie. As a rule of thumb, when recipes call for brown and white sugar, it's to get the best of both worlds in terms of flavor and texture. And this recipe does just that. We're also gonna add for additional deep flavor, a half a cup of dark molasses. After adding your molasses, add two large eggs, one at a time. And two tablespoons of safflower oil. This adds a moistness and a chewiness that would be unsurpassed, I think, in a lot of cookies. Now your dry ingredients, one and a half cups of all-purpose flour, one teaspoon of baking soda, a half a cup of quinoa flour. Quinoa flour is best in baked goods, such as pastry and pie dough, that can benefit from its pronounced flavor. It pairs very well with orange, with molasses, with honey and dates. And because we're using some strong flavored molasses in this cookie, 
I thought it would be great to incorporate a little bit of the quinoa. It's a pseudo grain, it's not a grain, and it was once sacred to the ancient Incas. It is a very good source of protein and fiber. One teaspoon of cinnamon goes into our dry ingredients. One teaspoon of allspice, very strong allspice. And one teaspoon of ginger, ground ginger. And don't forget, half a teaspoon of salt. The batter looks beautiful. And then on low speed, add your dry ingredients. This is a very, very moist dough. So it's imperative that it rests in the refrigerator for at least an hour or even overnight. So this looks wonderful. Cover and chill. So now the dough has chilled for an hour and it is time now to form the dough into 24 balls, give or take. Uh, and I'm using a one ounce ice cream scoop. So just like that, just scoop them out like you're making ice cream cones. So much fun. So we need 24, so four by six will fit. So you can make these up till this point and freeze the balls so that whenever you feel the urge to have chewy molasses crinkle cookies, you can just go to the freezer and take out some dough balls and make your own delicious cookies. And then cover this again with plastic wrap and chill for at least another hour, preferably overnight. And I have a tray all ready to proceed with the next step. So here are the chilled balls of dough. You can just roll them even a little bit rounder and then in turbinado sugar, which is almost the same color as the dough. So place these on a uh, nonstick baking sheet or on a parchment lined cookie sheet like this. Turbinado sugar is amber hued and less refined than evaporated cane juice, which is turned into white sugar. And so because these spread quite a bit, I suggest only five per sheet. Preheat your oven to 325 degrees and get these right into it. You can rotate your cookie sheet halfway through the baking process. They flatten out a lot and the center should be set. Uh, that takes about 14 to 16 minutes. And wait till you see how pretty these cookies are. This is how the chewy molasses crinkles bake. Thin, crispy, and yet very chewy. These can be stored between layers of parchment in an airtight container at room temperature for up to five days, believe it or not. But they can also be put in a decorative cookie jar and you can put this out on your counter. They won't stay in here very long. And I think you'll agree that the combination of quinoa, molasses, and spices is a heavenly combination. These crisp slice and bake buckwheat espresso cookies are really irresistible. The cookies call for buckwheat flour, which heightens the pleasantly bitter flavors of coffee and cocoa nibs, making them a deliciously grown-up treat. Start with your dry ingredients, one and a half cups of all-purpose flour and three quarters of a cup of buckwheat flour. Notice the difference in color. Buckwheat is sort of a grayish brown. And buckwheat is not a grain, it is a pseudo grain. Comes from the seeds of a plant that looks kind of like the seeds of rhubarb. So there's three quarters of a cup. Oh, by the way, just start creaming your butter. Two sticks of butter, half a pound, at room temperature, with two thirds of a cup of white sugar. Into your dry ingredients, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt and a tablespoon of good espresso powder. And when I say good, I mean high quality, something that you like the flavor of, the same that you would use in your chocolate Diablo cake. So I'm mixing all the dry ingredients together. And 
one and a half teaspoons of vanilla right into the sugar and butter. You can scrape down your bowl. And now you can add your dry ingredients. There are no eggs, there's no liquid, just basically butter and different kinds of flour and cocoa nibs. You could make this by hand, but because it's such a heavy dough, it would be a little hard to stir by hand. Looking good. Now you can sprinkle in a third of a cup of cocoa nibs, pure chocolate. So the cocoa nibs are the center of the uh, cocoa bean. After it's fermented, uh, these little cocoa nibs are what's inside the hull of the cocoa bean. And that's your dough. Pretty easy. This has to be chilled in a log and then sliced into individual cookies. And it is a dark color. The log should be formed about 12 inches long and one and a half inches in diameter. You want it completely solid because when you slice it, you want it to slice in a lovely fashion. This is about right. Roll it up in parchment and chill. It should refrigerate for at least an hour. And of course, you can keep it overnight up until a day or so. Uh, unwrap the dough. Once it's chilled, then form your cookies. So put that on a baking sheet and chill. So here is our chilled dough. I would cut the end off and then you should be able to get about 30 cookies. I'm gonna just mark this about a little less than a third of an inch thick and slice carefully through. And I like it because it is an unusual color. If it breaks a little bit like that, don't worry, just kind of press it back together and get these on your baking sheet. They have to be placed about an inch apart. Make sure your oven is preheated to 325 degrees and uh, the rack should be in the upper and lower third of the oven. Use a very sharp knife and get these right in. They only cook for 13 to 15 minutes. Very fast because these are small cookies. So when the cookies come out of the oven, just transfer them to a wire rack, let them cool completely. Then put them in your cookie jar. Put them on a tray like that or on a plate in your pantry where everyone can help himself or herself. I suggest you keep a batch of this dough in your freezer, ready and waiting for the next time you have a cookie craving. Thank you very much for joining me, and I hope to see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. My favorite way to eat chocolate is with a jazzed up s'more. To make your ganache, take a one-to-one -one ratio of warm, heavy cream and chocolate, and once the chocolate is soft, stir it until it's completely smooth. Whip it up until it's nice and airy, apply onto a graham cracker. Cut your marshmallow in half and stick it onto the end of a skewer and torch it or use your stove top. Sprinkle the cocoa nibs onto the ganache, place the marshmallow down, grab your other graham cracker, an extra gooey, extra crispy, some more.